Yeah, that's me. <laughs> I want to tell you today about how this election felt to me. <clears throat> it felt like I knew that I had a neighbor who was a little bit racist. He had a Trump sign in his front yard. He had a lot of bumper stickers on his trucks of the character Calvin peeing on different things that he didn't like. And I was comfortable with this neighbor. We had a very live and let live attitude towards one another. <clears throat> and then on November 9th, I, I woke up to discover that I actually had five million neighbors, a surprising amount of them white women, and they were part of this club that built rocket ships in their basement. And on November 8th, they collectively flew their rockets into the moon, and I looked up, and it wasn't where it was supposed to be. It felt that catastrophic and disconcerting. Not only because I really count on seeing the moon in a reliable orbit, but also because my people, you, LGBTQ organizers, <clears throat> we'd been studying the tides, and some of our ships were coming ashore. Some of our ships had landed. We thought we were waiting for a rising tide, and then our racist neighbors torpedoed the goddamn moon. The tide wasn't coming in. And I just want to pause here and say that my non-white friends have given me feedback and have said that mine was a very white response. Uh, they never had that unqualified optimism that all the ships were landing. Um, the moon, they said, yeah, it had been blown out of orbit for them, but they had a hunch that that's what their neighbors had been up to the whole time. So, uh, like many of us, I responded to this with a combination of crying, organizing, like my children's lives depended on it, because I felt like it probably did, watching old Obama speeches, and then crying some more. This is really not a sustainable model of advocacy, guys. <laughs> it's not. It's not. I was also recognizing that the work that I do, creating relationships in highly hostile church environments, was taking a toll on me in a way that it hadn't before. Just a few months ago, I had lunch with a pastor who'd been a leading voice in uh, the legislative opposition. He'd called me out in the newspaper. Uh, he'd continued to make this case that discrimination is a uh, Christian value. So I invited him to lunch, which is what I usually do. But after two hours of doing our best to create honest dialogue with each other, I drove away from the meeting with this feeling like I had lost a pint of my blood. And you know what that feels like. <laughs> like if they did a metaphysical CAT scan, on you, they would find teeth marks on your soul, right? It's taken a chunk. I realized I really needed a better self-care plan <clears throat> than crying and watching Obama speeches. <laughs> so my friend who's a Catholic priest pointed me to the work of Richard Rohr who noticed that the secular crowd had a really high burnout rate, especially compared to the nuns and the priest who did social justice worker. And I don't know about you, but I am a highly and inappropriately competitive person and I really wanted to win the not burnout game against the Little Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> Rush them. So Richard Rohr says that social justice organizers need to be grounded in a contemplative practice. The best scientists say that medicine and meditation and exercise have the highest rates of success, and I believe them, but I'm just gonna stick today with what I actually do and what works for me. So here are my top five self-care tips. And one, what my self-care isn't, and I just want to get this out of the way, self-care is not jettisoning an intersectional lens. It's not taking a white feminism four-year extra-long spa day, right? We know that. It can't be me first, you last, because the thing about the scarcity model is it isn't true. There is enough for all of us, and I need, you need, the leadership of people of color, of different abilities, undocumented and trans people. These are the people who teach us, as Johnny Cash says, what we don't know how. So don't let your self-care become self-absorption because that ain't right. Uh, two, I feed people and I get fed. And that's not a metaphor. I don't mean I'm feeding my soul. I mean my hands are making food for the people that I love and that I create community with. 
And we should also play to our strengths. We're queer organizers. You either are a vegan or you know one. <laughs> right? But let's be real about that. Um, it's one of life's great mysteries that people who can't use butter and cream make the most gorgeous desserts. Uh, but it's true. So trade them for a massage or, if you must, looking at you, Amanda, a lesson on vote builder. But get fed. Three, I read poetry. If we've known each other for any amount of time, I've probably recited something to you, whether you wanted me to or not. <laughs> poetry restores beauty to my soul when the world feels leaden and full of ugliness. The poet Wendell Berry reminds me that when despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. And when you are dealing with hard-headed legislators, the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova has some rather on-point verses about corrupt politicians. In Laramie, they formed the Wyoming Art Party, a radical art collective who creates sculptures and banners and signs for activism around the state. Their presence reminds me that we don't need artists to convey a strategic message. We need them to repair the teeth marks in our soul. They return us to wonder and awe when we are in the most dire need, when the hounds of cynicism and despair are nipping at our heels. Three, I force my language to be gentle. I know, I hear that. <laughs> but forcing gentleness on my language is the only way that I can do it. So I don't refer to anyone as a trash person or a human dumpster. I want to, but I don't. I try my best to guide my, my words to places that recognize the humanity of my opposition, even when they're doing me harm. And I don't do it for them, I do it for me. Because I do not want my heart colonized by their hostility. Four, I'm learning to step back. We all feel the urge of this moment, the intense need to resist, to respond with everything we have, to keep throwing ourselves at that electric fence until it gives. This is not a sustainable model of advocacy. <laughs> After my draining lunch with a pastor, I didn't go to my next appointment. I drove to the Catholic Church in Laramie, a church that a humanist Baha'i, you, you, has no claim to. I let myself into my friend, the music director's office, and lay down on the floor. I cried a little. I let myself feel what I feel. And then I got up. I talked to the kind priest who loves his queer parishioners. And then I drove home to Cheyenne. I didn't ask anything else of myself that day, even though there was work to be done, because there is always more work to be done. Five, I lean on you. I ask my community for help. I tell you when the hurt feels severe. I tell you when I need space. I tell you when I need to break into a municipal swimming pool in the middle of the night, because my body needs to feel less burdened. I need to feel, as the poet says, the grace of the world, and that may mean a late night trip to Home Depot to purchase bolt cutters. <laughs> These are the things that work for me, and I don't know if they'll work for you, but I know that you, every one of you, deserve to feel cared for in this terrible moment, because our work is pulling the moon back into orbit. And none of us are so foolish to believe that we can do that without cost. But if we're going to beat those nuns and priests, we need to take better care of ourselves. Thank you.